tonight, rejecting a request for complete control over immigration. Quebec's push for power over who it takes in. If we want to protect our language, our nation, our identity. Denied by Ottawa as the Premier says the, the province is at capacity. <laughs> Migrants risking one of the world's most dangerous routes. They get lost, the children die, they rob them. The children trekking through the Darien Gap in search of safety. Plus, problem pests causing chaos on the tennis courts. Carlos is being attacked. He's not liking that, is he? No. The buzzing bees that brought play to a standstill. Play cannot continue. Play pause for a while here now. CTV National News with Heather Butts. Good evening. A long-running debate on immigration between Ottawa and Quebec is once again front and center. The push for full powers over the issue has been part of Premier Francois Legault's platform for years. A request for that control once again rejected today by the Prime Minister. CTV's Andy Bergeron Oliver reports. Hello. Hi. After years of high immigration, Quebec says it no longer has enough nurses, teachers and houses to welcome anyone new. That's why today François Legault asked Ottawa to give Quebec full control over immigration. If we want to protect our language, our nation, our identity, our culture, we need to have the powers regarding immigration. Quebec already has total power over the future of permanent residents and economic immigrants. But it shares responsibility with Ottawa over refugees, temporary foreign workers and newcomers who arrive through family reunification. Justin Trudeau today told Legault he won't bow to Quebec's demands. We are all about uh, rolling up our sleeves and working with the provincial government uh, to solve some of these challenges uh, here in Quebec, but right across the country as well. In the last two years, Legault says Quebec has seen an increase of 230,000 asylum seekers and temporary residents. The cost on social services to support those migrants, $1 billion since 2021. Experts say this push for more power is a ploy to get more money. People want to leave in Quebec or if they want to have their claims heard in Quebec, then Quebec has no power to stop them from doing so. So, again, I think this is largely political and, and may be used as a negotiation to get more funding. Jill Hanley helped found Montreal's Immigrant Worker Centre and calls the conversation about temporary migrants concerning. It seems like we're just looking for what the next group is that we can blame for the social problems when we really have a decade-long, decades-long problem of underinvestment. Legault says the Prime Minister seemed open to having conversations about how temporary foreign workers are accepted into Quebec. The two leaders will meet later this year, Heather, to talk progress. Annie, thank you. A majority of provinces are locked in a tussle with Ottawa over the impending hike in federal carbon tax. Today, the Prime Minister defended the deeply divisive policy, accusing an Atlantic Premier and fellow Liberal of caving into political pressure. CTV Sarah Plowman has more on the issue for us. Sarah. Heather, it's more than two weeks before the carbon tax is set to go up again, and that is pitting premiers against the prime minister. Today, Justin Trudeau accused Newfoundland's premier, Andrew Fury, of giving way to political pressure as all four Atlantic premiers oppose Ottawa's plan. I think Mr. Fury is continuing to bow to political pressure. Uh, I think Canadians in Newfoundland and Labrador and right across the country expect their governments to do the right thing. On April 1st, the carbon tax will go up from $65 to $80 a ton. Premier Fury, who's a Liberal, has called for a delay and has said the cost of living is high enough. The Prime Minister is defending his plan, highlighting the quarterly rebates that he says gives 80% of Canadians more money than they pay in the tax. Meanwhile, Conservative leader Pierre Polyev is doing campaign-style stops across Atlantic Canada to oppose the hike. Trudeau's April 1st carbon tax hike of 23% is scheduled to take effect in just a few weeks. April Fool's Day, and with Justin Trudeau and the Liberals, the joke is on 
you. How people feel about the carbon tax largely depends on their personal experience, says this political scientist. If you see it as a rebate and not a tax, you're okay with it. But if you see it as a tax, well, no, you're probably not okay with it. A topic that likely came up tonight as New Brunswick's Premier Blaine Higgs met with Conservative leader Pierre Polyev. Heather. All right, Sarah, thank you. The first aid ship carrying 200 tons of much-needed food has begun unloading supplies in Gaza, the latest efforts to ease a humanitarian crisis. It comes as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu approves plans for a ground offensive in Rafah. CTV's Heather Wright reports. Prayers amidst the rubble, as the first Friday prayers of Ramadan were held today in Gaza. Despite efforts to secure a ceasefire before the start of the Muslim holy month, fighting continues. Today, Israel rejected the latest terms presented by Hamas, calling them unrealistic, while also approving plans for a ground assault in the southern city of Rafah, where more than one million people are displaced. And while both Israel and Hamas have shot down recent proposals brought forward by the other, negotiations are still ongoing, with Israel dispatching a delegation to Qatar. We still have active conversations and now another chance to meet in Doha. That's all to the good. Now, I, I know for the families out there, it's just another set of agonizing days to wait. More desperately needed aid arrived in Gaza today, towed to shore by a ship. Still not enough, as many aid groups warn of a looming famine. Food is most scarce in the north, where deliveries can be deadly. Ibrahim Ahmed Deeb says it's too dangerous to go to the Kuwait Circle in Gaza City, where 20 people were killed today. Israel accused of opening fire. They blame Palestinian gunmen. Hunger is killing us, he says. I am leaving the north because there is nothing available. No food, no drinks. In Israel, families of those being held hostage in Gaza block traffic today, protesting outside a meeting of Israel's war cabinet. They are demanding the government reach a deal for a ceasefire that will help bring their loved ones home. It's been 161 days and literally they neglected their duty. Here in Toronto, pro-Palestinian protesters have gathered outside the King Edward Hotel as Prime Minister Justin Trudeau attends a Liberal fundraising event inside. Security, as you can see, is very tight. Police trying to avoid what happened nearly two weeks ago when an event with the Prime Minister in Italy's leader was cancelled due to security concerns caused by a protest outside. Heather Wright, CTV News, Toronto. There were some tense moments at that pro-Palestinian rally where hundreds gathered for hours to deliver the Prime Minister a message. Police shut down the area around the King Edward Hotel. One person was dragged away by officers after a scuffle and arrested. The protesters are demanding an end to the conflict. Donald Trump's former loyal vice president, Mike Pence, is refusing to endorse the Republican presidential candidate, saying he cannot in good conscience do so. This as a Georgia judge dealt Trump a legal blow in his elections interference case. Here's CTV's Washington bureau chief, Joy Malden. A big legal win for Fonnie Willis, the district attorney prosecuting Donald Trump and his allies for trying to overthrow the Georgia 2020 election. You might remember that phone call Trump made to Georgia officials. I just want to find 11,780 votes. Trump's legal team tried to get Willis kicked off the case, alleging she benefited financially from her romance with Nathan Wade, the man she hired to prosecute Trump. Judge Scott McAfee ruled there was no proof of a conflict, but gave Willis an ultimatum. She can stay, but Wade had to go, and he has now resigned. But the judge went on to chastise Willis for her behavior, mixing personal and professional, calling it a tremendous lapse in judgment, saying the romance created an appearance of impropriety that taints the judicial process and undermines public confidence. This is only a partial victory for the DA, and it does come at substantial professional and personal cost to her and Mr. Wade. In testimony last month, Willis was combative. Do you think I'm on trial? These people are on trial for trying to steal an election in 2020. I'm not on trial, no matter how hard you try to put me on trial. 
She survived, but not unscathed. And can Willis get the trial back on track for August? Because this case is so salient and so politically polarizing, it'll be very hard to find a, a panel of jurors who don't have some kind of uh, you know, pre-ordained uh, notion of what this case is about. And now Trump's hush money trial accused of concealing payments to a porn star has officially been put on hold to review more evidence. All of these delays could mean the former president won't face any of his criminal trials before the election. Heather? Thanks, Joy. Some voters are rebelling in Russia where a presidential election is underway that's almost certain to secure Vladimir Putin a fifth term. In St. Petersburg, verified security video shows a Molotov cocktail being thrown at a polling station, while in Moscow, a criminal investigation is underway after a woman poured dye into a ballot box. The three-day election will also take place in illegally annexed regions of Ukraine. President Putin's campaign faces little resistance, with two opposition candidates barred from running, and his fiercest critic, Alexei Navalny, now dead. The consequences of cyber attacks are becoming increasingly severe. The city of Hamilton, just outside of Toronto, was dealt a heavy blow following a cyber breach nearly three weeks ago. CTV's Kamal Karmali joins us with an update as the municipality shares some hard lessons. Kamal. Heather, we're learning that the city was asked for what it describes as a lot of money, but chose not to pay the cyber attackers. The demand was a whole hell of a lot of money. I can tell you that. The attack on February 25th knocked out several online services. The city has said no personal information has been compromised, though. Now the city is shifting from containing the breach to now a rebuilding of its IT systems. Although emergency and transportation services are working, the city says some phone lines are still down and many tasks need to be done manually. Some IT systems will come back online sooner than others and some can take weeks or months. What has happened here is it's awful, but cyber criminal attacks are becoming more and more frequent. Cyber attackers are becoming more bold in attacking municipalities. Toronto's public library also hit recently, but it costs millions, sometimes over a billion dollars to update their software, while criminals can find new ways to attack much quicker. The best defense for now is to have a third party conduct risk assessments to fill in those gaps, making municipalities a more difficult target for cyber attackers. Heather. Kamal Karmali in Toronto. Kamal, thank you. West of the city, 22 dash hounds have been killed in a tragic fire at a kennel. They all deceased in the fire. Uh, there was, I think it was 20 adults and two little pups. As soon as we had the fire knocked down enough, we went in and uh, brought out all the dogs. Firefighters were called in this morning after flames erupted in the attic. They believe an electrical issue may have sparked the fire. The dogs were being raised at the kennel to be sold. In Calgary, an armed standoff between police and a suspect entered its second day. The man holed up inside a home fired shots at officers with the tactical unit as police were executing a search warrant on Thursday. No one was injured, but police blocked off the home and told those who live nearby to shelter in place. Dramatic new video of the mayhem that sent frightened commuters running for cover during a rush hour subway shooting in New York. Let me out! Let me out! A confrontation escalated where the man dressed in black eventually pulled a gun. The man in yellow somehow got a hold of the weapon. Police say the rider was acting in self-defense. The man who instigated was shot and wounded with his own gun and is now in critical condition. At least three people are dead after violent tornadoes tore across nine states. Ferocious winds in Ohio reaching almost 220 kilometers an hour ripped through neighborhoods. Hundreds of storms barreled through the U.S. with dozens of homes damaged or destroyed. Coming up, a desperate journey. The children risking it all for a better future. Plus, an unbelievable hive of activity at Indian Wells.
Hundreds of thousands of migrants make their way through a perilous jungle between Colombia and Panama that's dominated by cartels, wild animals and robbers. W5's Avery Haynes spent six days in the Darien Gap and shows us firsthand what she saw. <laughs> Almost a quarter of all of the people who are doing this are children being carried, many of them being carried on the backs of their parents. I'm carrying a, a light backpack and it's exhausting. Sometimes those children get separated in a jungle that is steeped in danger. Our guide Wilmer warns it's not just animals, human predators prey on migrants as well. They get lost, children die, they rob them, they rape them. Over six grueling days, we hear stories like these. There were six men with weapons. This group was targeted by armed Panamanians. They were robbed and sexually violated. There's a rising panic when we come across two young girls, all alone in a clearing. I'm so scared. I can't be without my grandma. Just 12 and 13 years old, friends of and Kendra are cousins who've become separated from their mother and grandmother. Tiene comida. Tiene agua. Okay, I'm making a decision. They're coming with us. I don't want to move from here. I want to get there, but I can't. Without my grandma, I can't keep going. I can't go to a different place without my grandma. Your mother and your grandmother would want you to go on. They finally agree to stay with us and wait for their family at the end of the Darien Gap. This community called Bajo Chiquito. It's a sadly familiar story for aid agencies, children lost and alone in the Darien. We are aware that this dream can kill them. We've been able to identify nearly 100 children in the last year who have crossed alone or been separated. We leave Kendra and Frenzible in an area set up for lost children. You'll see them very soon. Okay? Okay. They're taken to a safe house to continue their desperate wait for their family. Avery Haynes, CTV News, Bajo Chiquito, Panama. And you can see the full episode this weekend. W5's documentary, Narco Jungle, The Darien Gap, airs tomorrow at 7 p.m. on CTV. Still ahead, Between the Vines. How artificial intelligence is lending farmers a hand. Harvesting tomatoes could soon get easier. CTV Spencer Turcott on the creation more than 10 years in the making. Artificial intelligence is coming for our tomatoes, but it comes in peace. A yellow-armed smart robot developed out of the University of Guelph uses AI-powered vision. It can actually see the tomatoes on the vine. And grips to secure the tomato and pick it. Getting a robot to do such a task isn't so straightforward, given the narrow working quarters between the vines. If the robot makes the wrong move, puts the wrong thing, uh, the whole plant is on the floor and you are losing production plant. With little room for error, why put a robot in this position if humans are so good at it? We have a labor shortage when it comes to working in agriculture. At the same time, the entire agriculture uh, industry is facing an aging problem. A recent report from the Canadian Agriculture Human Resource Council predicts one-third of the agricultural workforce will retire by 2030, meaning more than 100,000 jobs will need to be filled. So that's where the tomato-picking robot comes in. 
then of course the robot can work longer hours and stuff like that. Going from prop to crop has seen success. It's been put to the test at greenhouses across Ontario and now work is underway to make improvements. The challenge is to do all of this to match human cycle. Human cycle is six seconds per harvest, okay? Um, we, we have now here a system that is successful in terms of picking up these beef steak uh, tomato, but it, uh, at 18 seconds. So we are, the next stage is to bring it all the way lower to say eight seconds. The robot also analyzes the health of every plant and feeds the information back to a database to optimize the whole operation. Next, researchers want to train the robot to pick up peppers and strawberries, but for now, it's laser focused on tomatoes. So if this robot sees red, it's likely a good thing. Spencer Turcott, CTV News, Guelph. After the break. Ladies and gentlemen, they suspended due to bee invasion. The stinging tennis takeover. A global decline in the bee population seemed almost unimaginable this week. On the tennis court at Indian Wells, bees outnumbered and outmatched players and fans. CTV's Jean-Vier Bushman has all the buzz. And ladies and gentlemen, they suspended due to bee invasion. Now that's not an announcement spectators at this storied half a century old tournament are used to hearing. The buzz at Indian Wells forced a delay 19 minutes into play. Being attacked. He's not liking that, is he? No. One might have imagined someone so adept as Carlos Alcaraz at swinging a racket would be well suited to swat bees away. But as the slow motion shot shows, the second ranked player in the world, Carlos Alcaraz, was outmatched, outnumbered. Advantage bees as a swarm swooped in at Indian Wells in California during quarterfinal play between Alcaraz and Alexander Zverev. Well, I'm not going to lie, I'm a little bit afraid of the bees. Uh, <laughs> Dozens of them, apparently following their queen, rushed the court's spider camera. And that's Bill Gates there watching all the buzzing. Officials called in for help, and tennis's new hero walked in. Lance Davis, owner of a bee removal service called Killer Bee Live Removal. Armed with a vacuum and no protective gear, he swung into action and cleared the air to much applause. I think he has done it before. I think you might be right. After a two hour delay, play resumed and Alcaraz won handily. But even he knew that would be more of a footnote. Yes, yeah, it's going to be re remembered for, for that, not for, not for the tennis, not for, uh, for anything else, but uh, for the bees. Now that may sting, but it's true. Geneviève Bosch, my CTV News, Montreal. That's quite the sight. That is our newscast for this Friday. I'm Heather Butts. For all of us here at CTV National News, thank you for watching. Good night, and I'll see you again tomorrow.